Hey, welcome back to a, another video feature of the Immersive Worlds Handbook. Today I am in Oxford, actually getting a lecture today later on the subject of theme parks. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to stop in at the uh, very famous uh, Pitt Rivers Museum. And I don't do too many features on traditional museums, so I thought it might be a good opportunity today to uh, take a look. So let's uh, have a look inside. All right, so we'll begin the tour, and um, on my visit, I actually just took uh, a ton of video and still photography for you to uh, check out and take a look at. As I mentioned earlier, I don't do a lot of these videos on museums, and when I do, they tend to be contemporary, almost like pop culture museums, such as the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, and I think the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford is a long way from something like a Mob Museum, but I think all museums, right, have traditions that um, they share in common in terms of the display of objects, in terms of the layout of objects, and we'll talk about that in this video in terms of how these objects and forms of material culture are organized in great contrast with many of the museums you see today. Another thing all museums share in common, of course, is a emphasis on education of some sort, um, something that's didactic, teaching the public lessons or teaching the public about, in this case, the diversity of world cultures and as I am a cultural anthropologist by training for me a museum like this is very significant now I know that the museum certainly today given how it stands given the fact that the objects are laid out the way they are some of the displays perhaps that are say funerary in nature or have um, a context that could be a private context that maybe shouldn't be displayed in public I know there are controversies related to the museum, but all museums, of course, also share that in common. And I would actually add that as a characteristic of sorts to say that museums can generate controversy because of the perspective that they present to the public, whether it's a perspective of entertainment, as we see in some popular museums. And you're getting a sense of just the depth of the space here as we're walking through the galleries. By the way, I visited the museum originally in 2004 when I was teaching in the study abroad program in London through my college and so I had a chance to visit then and um, it's been a long time and I visit again in 2018 some of the things have changed and I'll try to comment on that if I can um, a little bit later in the video and I should note that the museum opened in 1884 uh, by the famous anthropologist Augustus Pitt Rivers and at the time had about 22,000 objects or so and over the years has grown to over a uh, half million objects because of donations and so forth. You see one of the um, interesting displays here it kind of has a almost gothic feel to it you can put coins in it and the figures move and so forth so it's kind of a thing that almost is a little horror like right in terms of the uh, the display here. So I'll show you a few more uh, stills here and then I'll give you some on-site commentary that recorded when I visited the museum. And again, I want to present the Pitt Rivers Museum to you today in the sense of being almost a throwback to earlier eras of museums. And I'll mention that in this video coming up. But essentially, the focus on typology, on the type of artifact, as opposed to the specific culture, that it belongs to is pretty radical to think about in terms of display. So here's my on-site commentary coming up right now. All right, so I'm just uh, taking a break from uh, looking at the collections here at the uh, Pitt Rivers uh, Museum in Oxford. And you know, this is really, if you like museums or you just like culture and um, certainly objects, this definitely should be on your list of uh, visits. It's really revolutionary in the sense of how it takes this approach um, to typology or object type. So you get um, an organization of the collections not through, say, periods of, periods of history or even culture areas as we used to talk about them in anthropology, but through the type of object, such as its function. So you have all the spears uh, in one area, you have weapons um, on one floor, you have um, different types of charms used in divination. My favorite was, and I'll have to do a thing in the video here on it, um, the section on recycling, which I thought was, was really cool. They didn't call it bricolage, but they called it um, recycling, so it was just really 
um, wonderful to, to, to see that and of course all the objects um, here in the museum. So I think, you know, from a pure like museum standpoint, there isn't a lot here that is say um, immersive or fancy, but the objects themselves, just how they are organized um, in categories according to type, and some of this follows by floor, so you get more of the weapons, say, the spears and firearms on the third floor. Bottom floor you get, um, you know, a variety of like cultural objects. There's a couple cases where, with the new air of Africa, um, a particular cultural group, where you get um, their own section. So I have to look into that certainly as, as far as what justifies the use in some cases of something other than the object function as part of the typology framing or grouping of those objects. But you know from a pure museum standpoint and you can probably tell just looking at the building but when you go in and as you enter um, first you see the uh, natural history uh, collections, which I notice all the uh, children in school groups are just starting to uh, flow in or stampede in, depending on your perspective, which always, I think, makes it a challenge to, to do a museum. But I get it, and it's good that, that kids are, you know, coming here with their schools. It seemed like most of the kids were doing activities with the geologic uh, collections, the paleontology, the dinosaurs, the natural history stuff. And then as you walk back into the museum, all the way to the back of, of this building, um, then you get into the, the Pitt Rivers um, archaeological, anthropological collections, which has always been my draw. Uh, and this is the second time I've been to this museum, and, um, you know, not a lot has changed. I will do some comparison with uh, my last visit, which I believe was in 2004. I did notice um, a few new things, and I'll, I'll talk about those later in uh, post-production. But yeah, just a, a, just what a wonderful um, opportunity if you get a chance to uh, come to Oxford to this wonderful um, ethnographic museum. It just has so much uh, to offer. As I said, it's very traditional in, in so many respects, but it's an opportunity to see how museums have been done since the 1800s and perhaps uh, learn some tips from the past in terms of current museums and some of the opportunities out there. A couple short uh, clips here that show you a map of the building and also the elevator. And this here is kind of interesting and something that was new since my visit. So, you know, museums in today's day and age have to think about how they publicize what they're offering to the public and how they connect with the public. And so one of the things you can do is use social media. In this case, they use a video screen um, that allows you to give some responses. And you can see they're, they're pretty specific here. What is the one thing the museum is about? Material and technologies, colonialism, how people solve problems, innovation, design, and so forth. And so it's kind of interesting to think about, now you're giving limited choices, but it's curious to think about the fact that they're emphasizing this connection with the public. Does the museum give enough information about the history of collections? Yes or no? I think I might have answered no on that. But of course, the question is, you know, should it, right? It's definitely a throwback in terms of what it's trying to present to the public. If you think about how we understood the world in 1884 versus today. How would you like to provide extra information about the collections? And this gives you some options, a blog, mobile content for your device, leaflets, and so forth. Are you likely to use the museum's website to find out more about the collection? So I like the fact that they're using this to really generate knowledge from the public. This is also very good here. How did you hear about the museum, right? So quite a few choices there. So any museum, even one that opened in 1884 and has tried to preserve the structure of its collections, needs to think about publicity, needs to think about how it responds to the public's interest. Um, some other things that have changed, you know, some of the displays are inherently the same as I remember them in 2004 during my last visit, but as I've uh, read about, they're constantly changing things. But some of the things, like even that human form and art sign that you see there, there's nothing remarkable remarkable about it. If anything, it, it almost appears very, um, I don't want to say mundane, right? But it, there's nothing flashy about it. And I think the emphasis here is on the collections and on the objects. So having the signage that is this almost sterile, 
I think allows the viewer to take in that sense of history, the throwback museum, and also to focus primarily on the objects. As I've mentioned in some of my commentary, focusing on typology and is you know very different for how we think about museums in today's day and age. And having this preserved historically, I think, gives us a real feel of how many museum, museums used to be. Indeed, Pitt Rivers, like a lot of other cultural anthropologists of the time, again, think the late 1800s, were very interested in the idea of evolution, and specifically not biological, but cultural evolution, which is very controversial today. And so if you're showing certain objects, and you're trying to show the progression of objects over time, you would typically attach those objects to periods of culture, to innovations, to institutions, and so forth. And the cultural evolutionists, of course, were controversial because they always assumed that white, um, Western, European, American culture was the most superior culture to indigenous culture. And that's one aspect, I think, of a museum like this. When you see all these objects put on display, you cannot help think about the era of you know, colonialism. And indeed, many anthropologists were complicit with colonial administrators in terms of trying to repress people. So anthropologists certainly have a lot to think about in terms of atonement and um, thinking about just you know the history of the discipline relative to the past and the eras of colonialism. But I think what I'll do now is I will show you the, um, the rest of the collection. It's not the whole collection, of course. It's my impressions of what I saw during my visit in 2018. So I'll show you the images. I will bring up the music a little bit and just let you take this in. If you're interested, you should certainly visit the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford if you get the chance. It's uh, free and it's uh, well worth uh, your visit for sure.
All right, I hope you enjoyed the video feature today here in Oxford at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Please come back for additional video features of the Immersive Worlds Handbook.